Hello and good evening and welcome everybody to the penultimate event of this year's 2021 virtual, predominantly, York Festival of Ideas. I'm really delighted to uh, welcome so many of you here this evening. This has been an event that has been two years in the making. Um, I first started to try to match make John Crace and Tim Dowling in 2019 and then a certain Tory party leadership election happened and all our plans went awry and Tim was left standing on his own in the stage. Uh, so here we are two years later and a year of lockdown and we finally managed to get them together. So I hope we're in for a really good night. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notices. First of all, if you uh, require or you want to switch off uh, the subtitling, you just simply go to the bottom of your screen and press on live transcript and you'll find the hide subtitles or turn subtitles on. Uh, second of all, if you uh, want to ask questions, the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen is uh, open from the start. And so do uh, send lots of questions. I've got some questions to put to John and Tim, but I'm going to be eager to bring you in as quickly as possible as well. And then finally, if you have um, any Wi-Fi connectivity issues and you drop out, just simply come back in on the link, the link on your Eventbrite ticket. So on to tonight. I think John and Tim don't need very much in the way of introduction, but as a quick reminder, uh, John Crace is the fantastic parliamentary sketch writer uh, whose columns I am utterly addicted to and has kept me pretty sane over the past uh, year. He's the author of the fantastic book, I May Bot, and also, um, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, which has to go down as a really seriously good book title. Tim Dowling, um, who is a frequent festival uh, attendee as well, and it's popping up on my screen, um, is also a journalist at The Guardian. Um, but we'll come on to whether or not these two actually work a lot together um, as we go forward. Tim writes a column on a weekly basis that depicts um, his family, whether they want him to or not, and his family life. He's also the author of a number of books, including uh, the fantastically named Dad You Suck, which I think he's going to blame one of his sons for. And he is also the author of a podcast, uh, an audio, um, we were talking about podcasts earlier, an audio book um, on cynicism, which I thoroughly recommend as well. So um, with no further ado, uh, John and Tim, shall we just get started? Um, I guess my first question, just picking up on that theme of lockdown, uh let's talk about your your own perspectives of the last year tim from your shed that isn't really a shed let's face it it's a shed. And john <laughs> it's the poshest shed i've ever seen and i grew up on a farm um <laughs> and john in tracking kind of political and distilling political turbulence give us the distilled version of your year and we seem to i think john's fallen off his chair <laughs> 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 Tim, why don't you start? How has your year been? Well, uh, I remember uh, us doing this last year, and I may have made it seem like about four months into the pandemic that I could do this sort of thing standing on my head, that I, you know, that I lived, uh, I would basically self-isolation was my lifestyle anyway. Um, 
but uh, it's been very difficult. It's been, uh, I think it really kind of started to really get to me around January mm -hmm. when it was still going on. You know, I think the other thing is last June, we thought this is basically over. Jul by the end of July, we'll all be, you know, I, I went on an, on a holiday, like a, mm -hmm. like a normal holiday, mostly with a mask on. But, um, you know, since then it's lo locked down proper. What we, you know, I'm sort of nostalgic for the old lockdown now. I mean, for like hoarding and stuff. <laughs> I love hoarding now that I think of it. Uh, so it's been a sort of, it's been difficult, I think, mentally to just keep going with the same old thing. Uh, it's been difficult as it gets worse, it gets deeper. You know, you think this is, this is the economic hardship for everybody is, is horrible. I've, you know, I've been comparatively fine. Nothing's really happened, but you watch businesses around you close down. You watch uh, industries suffer. Uh, and you know that when this is all over, there's going to be, you know, not a lot we can do about a lot of that. Uh, so it's been pretty difficult. But it's also been one of those years of, uh, you know, I suppose a year of a lot of hope and a lot of cynicism simultaneously. I mean, John will probably talk more about sort of politics, but I think, you know, electorally, it's been an amazing year of, of highs and lows happening, you know, mm. side by side, a split screen in a lot of cases. It does feel like there's a huge amount of flux. John, how has your year been? Because you have been at the heart of charting so much political um, disturbance and effectiveness. Is that a word I could use or ineffectiveness? How's your year been? Um, well, actually, it's, it's mine's rather mirrored Tim's in that last year, I kind of felt, you know, it was it was manageable. It felt that, you know, the, I could see some upsides to working from home and but round about January this year my anxiety got worse and it just sort of felt like we were in it forever really mm. um and it suddenly became uh, all, all a bit too much and I mean there have been moments of hope I think the vaccine without the vaccine um it would have been you know, we we would have sort of had nothing. I mean, it seems it seems weird to think that actually this time last year, we were, uh, as Tim saying, thinking it's all nearly over. Um, we were going to go on holiday. You know, we were going to unlock. We had Rishi Sunak. You know, eat out to help out. I mean, you know, in the end, that that was a move that probably cost a lot of people their lives. Um, and I mean, one of the things that I, I, I've noticed with my in my job is the way that sort of some people get to carry the can and some people seem to get a very easy ride through it. And Rishi Sunak has, seems to have had a very easy ride. Do you think you might be inclined to give him a less easy ride? You are, um, after all, a, a, a media voice who... Um, distill characters in very interesting ways that can define their public persona. I'm thinking of Theresa May's Maybot, which reached peak ubiquity when the Daily Mail started coining it and it was shouted out in part. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was a sort of that was a sort of strange moment to hear something that had just been existed in my own mind and in my own columns, sort of take on a sort of more global uh, mm -hmm. Or certainly, sort of national uh, standing. I mean, I think even the New York Times Germany. used it as well. What? I think the New York Times used it as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if only one could have a patent on that kind yeah. of thing, I would have retired <laughs> it a long time ago. Um, I mean, I'm never that certain how much difference, you know, uh, political satire in the end really makes. Um, you know, it would be, you know, I, I think it's an important sort of outlet, but does it really affect any change? I mean, things seem to have got worse rather than better since I became a sketch writer. So, and I don't know whether that's down to me or, um, uh, because we've sort of ended up with Boris Johnson, um, and I kind of thought with David Cameron, things couldn't get much worse. Then we got Theresa May. And then you think, wow, okay, well, maybe okay, we can go this low. But how, you know, can we go any lower? And then, yes, we can. 
I might come back to that in a moment. Um, so just last point on the last year. You both talked about impacts on mental health, and I think everybody's in, in some degree or other in that position. Is there anything, um, I mean, I personally, Tim, I think a real low point for you might have been taking to using the dog clippers on your beard, but um, <laughs> it probably amused the rest of us who read your poem. <laughs> So the key key low points, but also key high points. Is there anything from the last year you'd retain? We've been coining at the University of York a phrase of COVID keeps, and there are definitely things that people have said they want to continue. They they quite like the idea of working from home some of the time, but they want to be back on campus other parts of the time. What you know, is there anything that's happened over the last year that had never you know was caused by the pandemic, but you might actually think, oh, that's not a bad thing. I think I might hang on to that. Well, you know what? Clipping my beard with the dog clippers is actually a bit of a high point. I mean, I, it's, I saved a fortune. I didn't even buy new clippers because we already had dog clippers. And uh, I'm going to carry on doing that for certain. Um, I think one a lot of the stuff that, that that's made a difference uh, that's sort of worth keeping is this, like this technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we I probably last year spent a lot of time talking about how irritating I found all this and uh, and how difficult and how you have meetings, you know, at the end of meetings, you don't say goodbye anymore. You just, everybody just disappears suddenly. And it all seems so sort of alien. And we've all just got used to it. And, you know, it's, it's the technology has become more stable. It's, it's easier to use. It doesn't, it doesn't screw up as much as it used to do. And, uh, you know, I think if, if this, if sitting in traffic is the alternative in order to get somewhere, this is probably a great way to do a lot of things. It's a great way to interview people for work. You know, even if you're going to do it as a print thing, it, it you know, you can interview someone in California as easily as uh, they live down the road. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and I bought this microphone, which last year I thought was going to be a huge waste of money, you know, an absolute vanity thing. And I've got plenty of use out of it. So it's, uh, it's fully tax deductible, I believe. It's well, um, I hope the IRS agree with you. <laughs> John, what about you? <laughs> um, I'm not so sure on my kind of COVID keeps. I mean, you know, the, the downside seemed to be more prevalent to me. I mean, uh, I kind of miss going into Westminster. Um, I, I mean... It, it, in a way, it's sort of nice to know that I can work from home and that it is all possible. But I miss the human interactions. And I mean, I was also thinking about it in terms of, I mean, you know, this is a sort of, a sort of personal bit, in terms of my therapy, because my therapy has moved entirely online now. Um, and I really miss not being able to, because I'm in group therapy, to be able to kind of see, um, pick up on the body language cues of uh, both the therapist and the other people in the session with me. And, uh, but the therapist loves it and has made it clear that she's never going back to uh, have live sessions. So that's, I mean, like it or leave it. I mean, I I, I am now stuck with Zoom. But... It is interesting, though, because those visual cues, and I found that particularly when you're in a meeting where not everybody's in agreement, but you can't quite navigate how how strongly somebody feels because you're missing the foot tap or, you know, the clenched kind of hand or whatever, that you really <laughs> do miss quite a lot of visual cues. I'm, I'm suggesting completely erroneously that we spend our lives arguing with each other at the University of York. It's so not true. Um, but just picking up on something that um, Tim mentioned earlier around cynicism and this idea that people have lost trust and perhaps even more so when you think about the impacts of the pandemic, particularly on those who are most vulnerable, there does seem to be a kind of hardening of this idea that anything approximating the pillar of state, the media, politicians, the judiciary, the space of one thing after another in terms of people's feeling alienated. Do you think there's any way of, this, is there a cure for lack of trust? Um, has the pandemic just hardened that? Are we, are we now in a place where we're all going to start feeling like nothing is trustworthy? Do you feel that in, in kind of the work that you do or do you have a sense of hope? Is that for me or for Tim? For either of you, but since you're talking, you go first. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's it's a chicken and egg thing. I mean, because before the pandemic came along, um, the country had already voted um, Boris Johnson in, and. I mean, he is a man who we, who exemplifies sort of lack of trust, and and everybody knew what they were buying. I don't think there's any anybody who uh, voted for Boris Johnson thought that this was a sort of paragon of virtue. Um, so, in a way, the cynicism had been embedded in, and we've also got. Uh, I mean, it's just our luck that, you know, his first cabinet were, was selected purely on people's uh, holding the line on Brexit. It was all of, it was a Brexit cabinet. That's how people got into the Boris Johnson's cabinet. Um, and then sort of two or three months later, we find that uh, we're in the middle of a global pandemic when a whole range of other skills are required other than to say Brexit is a good idea. Um, and so in a way we've, you know, we're just having to live with it. Um, um, sorry. No, no, go ahead. This um, is one of those visual cues that we miss because we're not in a room together. Yeah. And so I, I kind of feel that by a mixture of uh, willfulness on the part of the electorate, um, you know, in in a choice in choosing in choosing Boris Johnson, um, and then the sort of bad luck of the pandemic breaking when it did, we we kind of felt we're, we're now in a world where we don't really trust anyone anymore. Um, and I mean, you know, we have Sir Dominic Cummings releasing take, you know, WhatsApp messages saying that Boris says that um, uh, Hank, Matt Hancock is completely useless. And you kind of think, well, I mean, there, there's something that rings true about that. Uh, but at the same time, there is something, and you, you know, you don't really want to trust Dominic Cummings either. Mm. So it's a question of sort of narrowing down your options of who to trust and who to believe, really. Tim, you mentioned political change, and obviously, as an American living in London, actually, I calculated by your column yesterday, you've now been living in the UK longer than you lived in the U United States. Yeah, that's that probably correct? right. <laughs> Yeah, um, right, I'm not yeah. going to disclose your age, but if you want to know, read yesterday's <laughs> column, people. So um, obviously there has been a big change in US um, political um, leadership. Does that make you feel a bit more hopeful or do you think some of the... It, it should have done, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it overall, it has. I mean, I think following up on what John said, that the problem of trust has become is not so much... The deceit it's that it's i feel like we're in danger of becoming sort of indifferent to dishonesty you know everybody simply uh, politicians now seem to sort of basically just worry about whether di dishonesty even if it's rank dishonesty or obvious dishonesty they just worry about whether it will have consequences and if it doesn't they lie and donald trump you know in 2016 you might have felt like donald trump invented this but um it's, it's now, it's definitely on both sides of the Atlantic. So I thought the election was, was going to be a triumph for restoring trust in American politics. And I sat down with my children who are all American citizens and take quite an interest in it. As a sort of family thing, we are going to watch for the first time ever, because it's the most boring procedural thing you can imagine, watch the vice president count the votes of the electoral college in the Senate so we can see that democracy has held sway. And uh, I, I, the screen was split in half. And on the other screen, they're watching, they're showing the tail end of uh, Trump's rally. Mm. And all of a sudden the rally got a bit sort of lively while this was going on. And suddenly the two split screens started to, the same thing was happening on both sides. There was a riot, you know, these people are breaking in. And I thought, this is, this is really spoiled this day for me, you know, this is, this is awful. 
And the idea, the, the idea that we're still in some quarters debating the result of that election is, is, a, is definitely a new low point for honesty generally and integrity generally. And the fact that there are TV channels where, where you, you can still spout that sort of conspiracist nonsense uh, unquestioned uh, really is the sort of, you know, I guess, you know, I always say a, a pessimist would say this is one of history's deepest troughs, but I think a, a cynic would say this is probably one of its peaks. It could get a lot worse. Um, so I, my, I have tremendous reservations about holding out too much hope for the future, but I think things are a lot better politically uh, in America today than they were six months ago. Well, let's hang on to that. Uh, ironically, John, I remember you saying um, that uh, I think during the leadership election that if Johnson won, he would have far more material as a sketch writer. <laughs> I'm imagining the answer to that is yes, um, that is true. <laughs> well, sort of up to a point, I think it's be careful what you wish for, really. Um, there was this, I, you know, just general feeling that because sort of Boris was a larger than life character, um that he would necessarily be easier to uh to sketch but there is only so much so many ways that you can sketch someone and, so and say the liar lied again um which is sometimes uh, I kind of I sort of look on Wednesdays for anything other than PMQs to sketch sometimes because you know what's going to happen. You, Keir Starmer is going to ask some questions and Boris Johnson is going to fail to answer them or answer as a different questions and then become mildly abusive. And, you know, the sum total to sort of democratic debate is sort of nil. Um, and really the, the way I, I kind of like to sketch, there's a, there's a fabulous line in the Leonard Cohen song, um, uh, there is a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. And I've always sort of used that as my sketching motto, really. Um, look for the cracks in the personality, and that's where you get to see the real person. I think. Um, and with Boris, there is just a sort of enormous crater, really. I mean, you don't need to let that. I mean, the light is in. And we're going back to what Tim and I were saying earlier. Um, you know, the, the trust, uh, trust has been eroded because nobody expects people to keep their word anymore. Um, you know, there was a time when ministers would resign if found in breach of the ministerial code. Uh, Priti Patel has broken it twice, and yet she is still Home Secretary. Michael Gove, Matt Hancock, and also uh, Boris Johnson have also been found to have breached, you know, the spirit of the ministerial code. There's no, no payback, no comeback at all. I mean, can you imagine starting building re you know, renovations on your own flat with having no idea of how much it was going to cost, who was going to pay for it, and whether you were going to account for the money or not? Um, and yet that was Boris's attitude towards doing up the flat at 11 Downing Street. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, rant over. It's, uh, fine. <laughs> it makes me really angry. Yeah, you know what? I think anger is the overriding emotion of the last 12 months. I find yeah, myself actually, having imaginary angry conversations with almost everyone as I walk down the street. So that segues very much to I was a question I was thinking, where, where is the right moment to say both of you, to some degree or another, get paid to make people... Um, well, the satire is an interesting construct, but it, quite often, John, you do make me laugh, even if you also want me to, want to make me throw my shoe at the wall. But I'm imagining that if you're in a state of anger, it's then more difficult to get yourself into a headspace where you can also simultaneously, either through satire or actually, I can't define Tim what it is your weekly column. No, <laughs> it's non-categorizable, <laughs> but I'm nonetheless, sorry. it still I'm makes sorry. me laugh. But presumably, this year has been quite difficult to try to um, distill that essence. Um, so the character, the characterization of how you you introduce some new characters, Tim. 
and John, leaving aside Johnson for a moment, who are the runners and riders of the other characters that you enjoy writing about? But let's pick up on the squirrel first to uh, <laughs> like own <laughs> the squirrel and the cat, who appears to be expanding its vocabulary on a weekly basis. <laughs> I, I, I am aware that uh, uh, the squirrel is, you know, the squirrel, first of all, I'm, I'm a, is a composite character made up of probably more than one squirrel. <laughs> um, I think the problem is during you, when you get uh, it, it happens in your family the same way it probably happens in Westminster in the sense that uh, as 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 John said people you know during the pandemic people tend to get up and say the same things to each other over and over and and just get sort of frustrated with each other and tend to you know look for little places where they can have some privacy in a crowded house so I've I've started to get up incredibly early for no reason and knowing that most of my children will not surface before 11 and I have this, all this time to myself and I end up having I spend a lot of time with the cat who is I, you know the cat is obsessed with me I don't know but how do you make a character out of an animal that's basically just bothering you all day and it I mean I think for <laughs> me character is something it generally comes from dialogue so if you want a cat to be a character you have to make it talk and that's, you know, that's basically what I've been trying to do for months now is figure out how to transcribe what a cat says. Yes, yeah, so well, I, I, I'm very much the third person in our house behind our cat who is similarly obsessed with my husband. Um, so I, I can feel where you're coming from on that. And, and John, the characterization of how you distill what you see politicians doing, does this come in a moment of epiphany or is it a kind of composite build up over periods of observation? Um, I'm, I'm interested in your characterization of other politicians that you also um, regularly feature, um, Gavin Williamson, Matt Hancock and so on. Liz Truss. It, yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you suddenly land and think now I've got it. This is how I want to frame what I say about their activities. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's partly a matter of, I mean, as as Tim was saying, it's about dialogue. I'm often trying to think of the dialogue that is going on inside someone's head, not what they're actually saying, but mm. what they must be actually feeling. Because I kind of think there's some Matt Hancock, Gavin Williamson and Liz Truss. Uh, I mean, it's a staggering degree of incompetence to have in in a cabinet and I like to think that at some level I mean the narcissism sort of sort of breaks down and that they must sort of wonder how the hell did I get to do be, be in this position and and so often I like to uh so sort of to sketch my might have in my sketches the idea of what what they they what what must be going on in their own head to justify how they're performing i mean if i was doing that badly on a daily basis in the public eye i think you know my self-worth i mean my self-worth is never that high at the best of times um but it would be kind of truly abysmal to be taken to the cleaners like sort of gavin williamson is every time he comes to the house of commons and yet, somehow he has this sort of charade to sort of shrug it off, really. Um, yeah, and I mean, none of those politicians are any good at defending themselves. And, you know, they don't they have no wit. They have no, no. They think on their feet and they, they tend to re parrot things. So they're, they're almost unworthy of a sort of as, you know, a review. So you've got your work cut out, I always feel, making them. Yeah. interesting. Well, also, I mean, it's a question of just sort of purely time because you know quite often something is uh the thing that i'm sketching happens at four o'clock between four o'clock and five o'clock and then i have two hours to turn out 800 words um and somehow i've got to be i mean i always think a good sketch should should be i mean of course it should be entertaining and hopefully there's laughs but i I don't think, you know, there are sometimes things that increasingly in the pandemic, there are things that aren't funny anymore. When 125,000 people have died, it's just, you know, that is something that is not funny. Um, but, 
you know, it's a question of, you know, you, can I make some kind of narrative, tell a story about the, the, po the political events of the day um, in a way that is slightly left field um, and to report it in a way that, you know, our, our ordinary lobby correspondents aren't because lo lobby correspondents are sort of hamstrung by the need to um, take everybody, I mean, what they say at face value, whereas I'm allowed to think about it and to question it and to make fun of it. It's interesting that you, you think you've got more time than a lobby correspondent because I'm always astonished at the speed where it feels like your columns appear a couple of hours after something's happened, literally steaming hot from the oven, as it were. Um, that sheer volume of stuff that you have to wade through and, and bearing in mind what you said earlier around the kind of mental health issues and pressures, do you feel that that's a contributory or a, a sort of almost it helps to be that busy and to feel under so much pressure? Because it, it does feel in looking at the speed at which you produce those columns, that it must be quite a pressurised um, sense of your own head needing to distill all of this so quickly? Um, it's, it's sort of weird because in the, in the build up to it, I mean, because when I know that something's going to happen at four o'clock, I mean, I get, quite, I get very stressed and very pressured, but in the actual writing of it, often I feel more calm. Um, I mean, but yes, I mean, uh, the pressure and the stress have got to me. Right. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't sleep particularly well. Um, and I kind of, I do four sketches a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And when I've sort of written the final sentence of Thursday's sketch, I have, I breathe this huge sigh of relief and the sort of actually try and pretend that next Monday isn't going to happen again. <laughs> um, except um, here we are on Sunday evening and I know that, <laughs> that but, barring a meteor uh net tomorrow will happen and i and i don't know what i will be sketching yeah if you told me when i was 16 that basically for the rest of my life i'd be handing in one overdue homework assignment after another at the <laughs> yeah. last minute that's my it's just what it feels like every day and you you can't believe you put yourself through it and i think i was with hadley freeman and a, and a couple of other columnists on another panel and everyone sort of said i mean i get the thing you know any column any good column is every week a sort of act of desperation on some level. You sit down with not enough stuff to make it work. And somehow when it's, when it's time to do, you know, it's meant to be due, you finished. I mean, it, you, don't, you don't, often you don't know how. It feels like being a constant exam. I'm gonna pick up some questions from the audience and there's a truly terrible one. I have to say, <laughs> the Festival of Ideas audience. Tim, if you had to get rid of one, the cat or the banjo, and now I'm going to lie down with shock. <laughs> I have two banjos. I've only got one. <laughs> oh, so this means you get to keep a cat, the cat <laughs> and a banjo. I mean, if I was allowed to get rid of my least good banjo, um, that would be a good solution. But I guess it would be the banjo. Um, but then I would expect the cat to live a couple of years longer than that. I mean, if the cat then dropped dead, I'd be furious. Yeah, you want some gratitude from the cat. Yeah, <laughs> you want some, you want, yeah, you want it, you want it to know that you've picked it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, well, I'm going to be interested to see how you you um, convey that um, that sense of uh, the cat being needing to feel more gratitude towards you, Tim, in in your next column. Um, interesting question here, given the kind of this the 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 whole issue about media landscape in the UK. Question here um, from Sue. John, have you been watch? Well, actually, have either of you been watching GB News? It seems to me that every journalist in the country is watching GB News. I'm not sure anyone else is. Um, am I am I wrong in that assumption? Um, I don't know who is watching it. I mean, uh, a lot of people have been watching it, hoping it, waiting for it to fail, and. Uh, though on last Monday, more people uh, were watching it 
than BBC News and Sky News combined. Mm. And so they, I don't, I think that they have, which meant that there was 350,000 people watching. And I mean, they can't, there can't be 350,000 journalists <laughs> there. Let's hope. Um, so I'm assuming that there must be some real people out there just sort of watching, thinking, what is this? Um, one hears that various uh, advertisers have dropped out, um, which makes you kind of think, what did they think they were getting into? I mean, GB News made no mis, you know, you know, made no bones about the fact that it was going to be the sort of UK equivalent of sort of Fox News, um, and uh, so. Yeah, oh, yeah, and when it delivers on that, uh, why is why 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 are they surprised? I mean, I don't know how long. I I don't know what the the market for it is. Um, I certainly can't imagine uh, you know it becoming that essential viewing. Really, um, no. Tim, I mean, can you cast your mind back to when Fox News made its appearance? Because it's clearly, to some extent, at least modelled on that. I idea. can't because it was so. It seems like it was so gradual to me. They they had you know Fox just took over a lot of local affiliates and sort of transformed itself into a cable channel bit by bit, and the news they took you know the regular local news became a bit strange, more right wing. It's very. It's a long time ago now as well. But of course, I I most of that time I was in this country and for a short period of that i had fox news on my my cable provider had fox news and and now nobody carries it i don't think in 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 the uk so i don't i don't see it anymore um and i i you know it's a pretty threadbare version of fox news gb news from what i've seen um they seem so intent on stirring up outrage that they're they're really fighting the culture wars of last month or two months ago they mm. keep bringing up all this kind of stuff that they they know is 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 this kind of thing they think people would be interested in, but it's it all seems so tame, and the people they get to come on and talk about it seem so lackluster. And I watch it the way I meant I think it's meant to be consumed, which is in you know short clips that are posted on Twitter by people who think they're funny, and because it's because they've gone wrong. So when all the lights go out, I laugh, but I I don't I don't hold out much hopes for it uh, succeeding, but you never know. You know, I mean, I think one of the mistakes it's made is that it hasn't really, it's it spent a lot of money on presenters and they they haven't really thought of anything very, very deeply about the architecture of actually putting on a sh on show. So as Tim says, it looks ropey, it looks cheap, the lights go out, the, the sets look like they've been sort of put together by you know uh gcse woodwork class um and you know if they if they'd spent enough money recruiting you know lighting technicians audio technicians proper radio produce uh, tv producers then you know maybe it would look more professional but at the moment you know i mean the mere fact I mean, there are a couple of must-see things, you know, like Rishi Sunak being interviewed by uh, Andrew Neil, but Andrew Neil can't carry the whole uh, GB news by himself. I mean, he can't do 24 hours rolling news for seven days a week, um, unless he learns to talk in his sleep. <laughs> um, well, you never know. Um, it does, you're both working journalists though, do you have a concern? Because it does appear to be based on the premise that I think Lord Rothermere first coined of giving the people something to hate every day. Do you worry about a general direction of media being hoist by social media? That thing that you said, Tim, about, you know, the, the bits that really have traction or the clips that get posted on social media because yeah. the audience is there and not coming to where the, the journalist is. I don't know. I mean, I think I mean, obviously that there's the, the kind of lowest common denominator debate has has the ability to attract people's attention. And, and if you find 
a, a way of reflecting people's anger back at them. They, they do seem to like it. But we already have talk radio. And if you want to watch talk radio, they usually have webcams on all the people. And, it, and, and you know, a talk radio, a, a sort of LBC with webcams is a lot slicker looking operation than GB News is already. So I don't, I don't know where you go from this. The problem that seems to me with GB News is that they've paired a, a, a bunch of veteran newscasters who seem to have been brought out of retirement with people who really aren't up to the job. And everybody's, you know, half the, half the people on there are looking ashamed of themselves most of the time. I, it just, uh, so, you know, I, I, I can't say I wish it well anyway, but um, I sometimes feel bad when I'm watching it. I can't watch it for very long. It's just, it's, it's not interesting. That's the most, when you, when you watch the little clips, you sometimes see something interesting, even if it's something going wrong. Um, when you watch it on TV, it, it cannot hold your attention for very long. It doesn't, you know, it can't even stir up my outrage. Yeah, I mean, I think Tim's right. It's got the, it's the worst fault of any TV station is it's a bit dull and a bit predictable because you know what you're going to get. And given the unpredictability of the news agenda, that really is the highest form of insult. <laughs> yeah. Switching gears slightly, and th this audience member assures me that she is not a stalker, Tim, but she would like verification as to whether this is the official work shed that you talk about on a weekly basis. And while I know the answer, I'm going to leave you to tell her what the answer is. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, and uh, obviously people looking at the angle, the lovely angle I've selected, it looks, it looks very deep. It looks very modern and uh, slightly more glamorous than I've let on. It, you know, I make it sort of sound like I'm working in a container truck at the end of my garden, but uh, it is, it is nice. But my, my wife, insisted on getting something i think she thought i would might live in it if she was lucky <laughs> but, uh, it's well, nice but i'm, I'm also assured it's fully demountable i can take it with me if i move it, it's 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 not permanent it, this it's is it though. I, I i would never have thought of myself saying the following sentence but i think i have shared envy <laughs> <laughs> well it is look yeah, it's, me too. Windows, it's nice yeah, very, very nice. Um, John, do you, you're working from home at the moment. Is your working environment important to you or are you able to set up camp anywhere? Uh, pretty much anywhere. I've got, a, I've got an office upstairs, but sometimes I feel really lonely and dissociated up there. I mean, being stuck in my office all day. I mean, uh, so, I mean, I, I mean, I have been known to work at the kit in the kitchen. I have been known to work, God forbid, in bed. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, no, so I mean, literally, I, I just my work. So much of my work is about watching Parliament live on mm -hmm. my laptop, and. You know, the, the Wi-Fi works throughout all the house, which is probably our crowning achievement of the last uh, lockdown. Uh, because prior to that, it would only work into two things, but we got a booster that uh, my daughter-in-law set up. Um, and so, so we're saved. Yes, where would we all be without our Wi-Fi now? We have a bundle of questions around various political characters. Um, so I'll start with the, the first one, which is um, very succinctly put. Will Dominic Cummings ever get another job? Does he care? And actually, I'll add to that. Do you care? Um, well, he, well he's start, he, tomorrow he is uh, doing a Q&A online. And you have to pay ten pounds a month to access his web his website. And um, I I I have I am one of those people. I, I'm hoping that it's tax deductible, <laughs> I, uh, or at least that the Guardian will pay for my subscription. That I I have sort of logged in, and he's doing he's doing a. Um, whether that counts as a job or not, I mean, I mean, he he lives in his sort of own world, really, and I mean, uh, uh, he he appears to have survived um, 
a long time without having really much of a job at all. I mean, in, you know, he he was very vastly influential during the referendum campaign of 2016, but then he disappeared out of the public consciousness um, and took to writing huge blogs that certainly nobody paid £10 a month for. Uh, and then when Boris Johnson became uh, leader of the Tory party, he was sort of brought back in and given this sort of 140 grand a year job. Uh, but now he's sort of back and I don't know, maybe he's fantastically wealthy and he doesn't actually need a job. Um, that's my secret suspicion, actually, is that he's also one of these people who um, you know, has for private income and you know, can sort of pick and choose and sort of, but you know, set himself up as a sort of grand thinker. I, I'd quite like to be a grand thinker, uh, if that meant that I could sort of stay at home, uh, do nothing for quite long period of times, and then maybe sort of release once every three or four months a 7,000 word sort of sprawl. I mean, the worst thing about his sort of blogs is that they're completely unintelligible, a lot of them. I mean, he, they're unedited, and I don't know if he's sort of gone back and read them before he even publishes them. Um, mm. But he, he's a strange character. I mean, have we heard the last of him? Oh, God, I mean, I don't know. I mean, he seems to have, we haven't really got to the bottom of why he hates Matt Hancock so much. Mm. Um, I, I don't quite get it. Um, uh, you know, so there seem to be other people to blame as well. Well, indeed. And, and so actually flipping this to the other side of the house, as it were, um, a couple of questions about your views about Keir Starmer. One in particular caught my eye. John is good at catchphrases. How about Starmer self-harmer? Um, <laughs> <laughs> which um, I, I'm merely reading out and conveying to you, but your general view of the effectiveness of the opposition at the moment, um, as somebody who watches this stuff on a daily basis? I think I think, I mean, you know, Keir, Keir isn't the most charismatic of characters, but I do think sort of uh, on a kind of serious note, I mean, I think any opposition would be really hamstrung at the moment. I mean, because the, the government has only got to go vaccine and, you know, they, they have got undeniably got something right and that is sort of something to sort of get behind. Mm. Um, and, you know, but I mean, Boris Johnson, uh, you know, all this sort of Captain Hindsight stuff, the, that, uh, I mean, it, it's sort of nonsense because a lot of the stuff that sort of Boris accuses Starmer of being Captain Hindsight is actually Captain Foresight. He was sort of saying, you need to unlock, you know, you, or you need to lock down earlier back in October last year because of the sage minutes in September. And sort of Boris, you know, just sort of say, oh, you know, this is nonsense, this is nonsense. And then at the end of October, locked down again. Mm. And, you know, the same, the same went for, Boris saying it'll be all over by Christmas and we're going to have a Christmas thing and then you know about a week before Christmas everything that get, everything gets cancelled again. Um, picking so, that, sorry picking up on that weekly theatre I've just picked up a, a question in the audience I'm interested in both of your views actually because the question is is there any point to PMQs anymore John you talked about the the predictability of Starmer asking some questions, Johnson not answering those questions. And Tim, what does it look like to somebody who, well, actually you have been here so long, maybe you're just used to it as well, but you know, that whole idea of Westminster theatre, it, it, does it feel quite hollow now? It does, it certainly feels, I sometimes think, because I watch it more than I used to, just because the, be, I mean, being a writer and having a computer that can access anything, Mm. means that you spend your whole life trying to distract yourself from what you're trying to do. So if I see that PMQs is happening, 
right while I'm sitting there, you suddenly just click over and you're watching it. And I think the one thing that strikes me is that um, the opposition really needs the rest of parliament back. You know, the, 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 a lot of the stuff that Boris Johnson is saying would attract, you know, these roars of outrage from the opposition if there was anybody in there. But it all seems to go, you know, it's, it seems like a bit of a sort of, you know, hollow pantomime, the whole thing without people in there. Uh, and he feels like he can say what he likes and doesn't get any trouble. Because I think the thing is that Boris Johnson is one of those people who would be very stung by the fact that people, um, you know, disapprove. This but it's not, it's not working at the moment, is all I would say. John, do you, do you have a revised view of what PMQs could do in the future, or is it um, never going to change in your view? Um, I don't think it will change is the simple answer. Um, it would require the speaker um, to intervene on a, on a level that not even John Burko was prepared to do. Mm. Uh, I mean, if the speaker was to say, you haven't answered the question, answer the question, you know, each time and continually interrupt, then it would, uh, uh, possibly make a difference. I mean, I mean, I, I do think there is a sense that PMQs is an irrelevance to the sort of ordinary political narrative of the week. Um, it's something that sort of really exercises sort of people like me, um, who you know, who sort of are political geeks and uh, you know, kind of follow the minutiae mm. uh, but I don't th I don't think it alters the dial on how the public really sees the, the Prime Minister mm. or indeed Keir Starmer particularly I mean the only uh, it's only real value and uh, this goes back to what Tim was saying is in making the opposition MPs feel better if you know if Keir Starmer has a particularly good week and you know, it's quite clear that Boris is blustering more than usual and telling more lies than usual, then, you know, it can make the Labour politicians feel, yeah, we're in with a shout here. Um, it, it works as a sort of mo piece of sort of motivational theatre rather than as a game changer. That's interesting. Um, two questions that I'm going to blend together. So politicians because are personal. You're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Tim. You, you, you froze for a moment. Did I so, freeze? I think... Yeah, you did. So go back and um, say what, whatever you were saying. <laughs> I, just, I just said it's weird that, that Parliament is the only place where people don't call Boris Johnson a liar, and that's only because you're not allowed to. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can get done. It, you could, I mean, it is, it is sort of unbelievable. Um, the stuff that they can say and get away with. Uh, and there's all this sort of convention of, you know, my honourable friend and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, and you kind of think, if this is honourable, God help us. <laughs> <laughs> so picking up on that theme, um, a couple of people have been asking, John, who your favourite politician um, has been either has been or is that, that you like writing about or that you feel you get good material from? Do you have a favourite uh, at this stage? Well, it's, it sort of changes, really. I mean, two of the people, yeah, in recent, in the last year of lockdown, uh, I mean, there's obviously been Boris for the kind of various sort of press conferences. I've quite enjoyed um, the journey of Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallance, um, because when when they first was uh, were wheeled out, they were sort of like sort of ingenues who didn't quite know what they were doing, and they didn't realise that they were being used as a human shield for Boris really, um, and now they've wised up, and you know they they don't take any nonsense from Boris. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they almost sort of relish saying that actually things are, you know, are still really bad. Uh, and I kind of quite like their, their journey into 
uh, from naivety into sort of some of the sort of real polity. Um, We're almost at the end, but I'm going to boil two final questions into one because they, they're coming from the same place, I think. So one of the audience members wants to know if you read the below the line comments in The Guardian under your columns. And related to that, somebody else was talking about the fact that you both, actually it was one of the reasons I wanted to have both of you speak together, is you both write about real people. Do you worry about what those people think about um, how you write about them? But, but first of all, the below the line comments, which are always interesting, I find, in The Guardian. Um, do they affect you? Do you ignore them? Do you never go, go near there? I, I used to, I, 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 always, I always said, I don't want anyone to know that I read them, but I do read them. <laughs> um, uh, and I don't read all of them. Sometimes you get, you know, if you, you, you trip something off and you get more comments than you can possibly read, even in a long afternoon of thinking exclusively about yourself. Um, but it's, it's, I think, you know, when we, this was meant to be the, the great thing of the future, this common thing, and it became snake pit very, very quickly. But I think in the in recently, the, either the moderation has gotten much better, or or people have got much nicer spontaneously. It's not it's not the bear pit it once was. I, I, and though, although I read them, I tend to stay out of them unless I've made a sort of catastrophic factual error, and then I usually go in there and apologize for it, which just to hold my hand up, which has happened. <laughs> John, what about you? Do you go near the below the line? Um, sometimes is the, is the, it, it really is dependent on, uh, time of day and how, I mean, I, I can only ever kind of dip in because for some reason, I mean, the sketch sometimes gets sort of a thousand, fifteen hundred comments or something, mm. and you can't possibly read all of them. Uh, and I would say like Tim, uh, that I, I think by and large, they the standard of debate on, on below the line has has improved really because it used to just be you know you're a bit rubbish do you get paid to do yeah you know, I can't believe you get paid to do this and you kind of you know uh you need to be some kind of masochist to read that on a daily basis yeah. Yeah. um but that's much less frequent these days um and generally there are people you know, engaging with with the ideas and with the people and, you know, chucking out their own thoughts. Um, which, which you know, on, on, you know, ha makes me think about what I'm doing as well. Mm. But also, I mean, you know, if I, if I filed late and the sketch goes up at eight o'clock, I'm not going to spend, you know, between eight and ten o'clock of the, you know, uh, of a long day, uh, reading my way through all the comments, because mm. um, I'm just too knackered. And then the people you both write about, um, Tim, your family, your long suffering family, as I frequently think of, uh, mm. <laughs> and, mm. and John, a very thin skinned government, it seems. How, what have been the various reactions to your columns over the past year? Uh, Tim, do you want to go first? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I always say the, the people I'm really careful about are my neighbours because, you know, they didn't ask <laughs> next door to me. And, you know, you don't want to fall out with your neighbours because then you can never sell your house. Uh, I'm, my family are most of the people I write about. I, it's much, I mean, I have a long-standing understanding with my wife uh, and I, I know how severely I will pay if I get it wrong because it's happened. Uh, but I feel like I know where the line is. And with my kids, the line has been shifting so that I have to be more circumspect about them every year that goes by because they're entitled to their own lives and, and privacy. Uh, but it's mostly people who, who aren't in my family who I worry about because you don't know how they're gonna react and you don't know, you know, because even if you don't use their names, they know who they are. And even if they don't read your column, some friend of theirs will generally be so kind as to point it out to them. And I always, I think if you, I always think if you're fair about people, then you don't have to worry about it. And if, if you, you know, if the butt of the joke is you instead of them, then you're safe. But people don't like being summed up. People don't, people think I'm, I'm much more than this. He's, you know, he's turned me into a two dimensional character. 
So I'm careful about it. Uh, but I don't always get it right, that's for sure. It's a mean job being a journalist. It just it's is. Right, yes. <laughs> John, have you had any particularly harsh reactions to anything that you've said in your columns from the politicians concerned, or have they just ignored it? Um, well, I do know that uh, Matt Hancock used to follow me on Twitter because he's stopped. He's, I, I assume I've been, I haven't been blocked by him, so I can still see his account. But I do know that he stopped following me on Twitter. Um, I don't really give it that much thought. I mean, I I tend to feel that um, the the politicians that I go for are generally government ministers. They are the people making the decisions that affect our lives, and I kind of feel it was their choice to, you know, to no one asked them to become you know secretary of state for health and therefore uh it's all part of the you know the melee really it's all part of, i mean sketch writers have existed for 200 years or something like that um and it's been there's a long tradition of it in the uk and uh <sighs> I, I honestly don't know how it goes. I mean, I, I have no real personal contact with any of them anyway. And I, I mean, I don't think many, uh, you know, any of the other sketch writers do either. I mean, they live in uh, rarefied uh, circumstances where they, you know, they have a ministerial car that brings them up to, uh, you know, Westminster whenever they're due to make a statement. And, they have special advisors who probably selectively cull the clippings that they get shown. So maybe they don't even read me. Surely not. <laughs> so we are slightly over time, but somebody's very insistent I ask this question, but I'm just going to ask for a name, which is from either of you. Do you think there is any, any competent politi is there a competent politician who could have handled the last year better, given we've... Um, We've gone through quite a lot of names. Is there anyone that you think um, might have uh, created a better environment? Yvette Cooper. Okay, Tim. I agree, but I also uh, I think uh, uh, you know Keir Starmer, any of the opposition. But I also think there's sort of a whole tranche of old uh, conservatives who suddenly seem like grand statesmen. So, you know, you, I suddenly think Jeremy Hunt would have handled this quite well compared to what's going on now. Okay. I think well, Jeremy Hunt feels the same. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly so. And on that point, I think we're going to have to draw uh, proceedings to a conclusion. But I want to say it's been worth the two year wait to get you both together. Um, thank you both so much for being so generous with your time and also being so open and so honest about the difficulties and challenges that you face that I'm sure will have resonated with lots of our audience members. So a huge thank you. I hope very much we can get you both in person back to York. Um, very soon um, so do keep a date in your diary for next year's festival but for now for anyone who has not read John and Tim's fantastic books or is not a regular column reader of both of them I thoroughly commend both of them to you it's been a real pleasure it's been my festival highlight talking to both of you and my big treat of a very frenetic 13 days on the final day to spend it with you two so thank you so much and thank you to our audience I hope I've managed to glean most of your questions over the past hour um, thank you all and have a lovely rest of the evening and a huge thank you again to Tom, uh, to John, <laughs> even, <laughs> to John and Tim. I'm coalescing both of your names into one. We so, are one uh, person. <laughs> yeah, you never see us <laughs> well, together. So, yeah, well, you know, you're, you're both on screen, but not together. But thank you very much to everybody and uh, have a safe rest of the evening and stay well, everybody. It's been a tricky time, but hopefully things will get better sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.